Okay, guys, thank you so much and welcome to United and Everything Football. This is episode 9. I can't believe we've already got into episode 9 of this beautiful podcast we've put together for you. As usual, I've been doing this with Kwame Chukwe Siako. Today we are joined by another special guest. His name is Philem. Actually, Sicho first. My bro, we call him Sicho. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, Sicho. Thank you so much for joining us, Kwame. And as usual, we discuss everything Manchester United and everything football. Uh, predominantly a podcast designed to discuss Manchester United and everything uh, within the European football. So, um, back-to-back wings um, over the last couple of days for United. The last time we met and recorded this podcast, it was back-to-back losses. But this time around, I can see the smiles on the faces of my, my people. Yeah, you know, people don't know, but Sicho is a United fan. People don't know. Let me speak to him here. He is a United fan. So if you see him, uh, you know, going so hard on United, uh, it's out of passion. You know, he wants to see the club get to a certain level. That's why he's always, you know, criticizing. But thank you so much, guys, for joining. Let me start with you, Sicho. How are you doing? It's been um, ages. Since we recorded a show together, yeah, yeah, guys, thank you for having me. It's uh, a real privilege to be, to, be, to be on this one. I've been looking forward to it. You know, we've had this discussion before, haven't we? Yes, about we getting on the podcast, and, and finally, I'm here. So, yeah, I am yes. delighted to be here. It's only been doing a great job, so yes. I can't yes. wait to get stuck in. Thank you so much for joining us. Kwame, you are all smiles. Why? You, you like the you winning know? feeling. The winning feeling is back. <laughs> <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, we can we can afford a smile, you know. I know. <laughs> I know. We you hell of back, like. well, the winning feeling is back. That's, so that's it. So we'll be looking today at the back-to-back wins against Burnley and also against Crystal Palace. And also, we'll do a preview of the game against Palace again. And in next week, I think we'll be playing against Galatasaray in the UEFA Champions League as well. Ticho will also, you know, try and do an assessment of everything that we to the club. Where are we at the moment? Uh, clearly, a lot of United fans are split on whether we are making progress or whether we are stagnated or I don't know. But I definitely think we are not really progressing. Some things we are stagnated, some things we are not making progress, some things we are not getting the style and all of that. So we'll be going into all of this when we come back from this short break. Okay guys, we are back once again here on United and Everything Football. It's been back-to-back wins for Manchester United after losing to Brighton and Bayern Munich. Um, right after the resumption from the international break. I will start with you, Sicho. Um, is it a relief for Manchester United fans and everyone around the club, given the circumstances surrounding the losses? I mean, there's been a lot of issues that has happened over the period. Anthony Dos Santos, Mason Greenwood, um, a lot of injuries Sancho. and everything. Jaden Sancho and, yeah. and a lot of things has happened. I mean, recording back to back wins, what do you think does for the club? And let's get into the games as well. So you can tie everything into it there game right. against Burnley and also the game against Palace. Yeah, I, I think, I think when, when, like you said, before you record, after you record, or before this one was recorded, we, you were talking about back-to-back defeats. Yes. And when you look at the way my United have played at the start of the season, haven't necessarily dominated games or excelled, and the number of games they've lost, the most important thing for the manager and the club and the players was to win and win anyhow, just to just to break that 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 losing streak. They had to win, and the, the fixture presented itself Burnley on the weakest sides in the Premier League. Not necessarily by the way they play, by by the result they've accumulated at the start of the season. Very young squad, inexperienced, lack of quality at times. So United had attacked more. You're expecting them to win. And I tell you what, it wasn't an easy fixture for Manchester United when they went to the more. It was kind of a difficult one. And if, if Burnley showed a little bit of quality at certain points of the game, they could have really troubled Man United. But when you are when you are short of confidence, when things are not clicking, as it wasn't for Manchester United, all you need is to just win and give you that feel-good factor. I take the pressure of the team. And that victory also then transmitted to the more recent game in the Carabao Cup where United and Old Trafford beat Crystal Palace. 
because I'm, I'm wondering if my United didn't beat Burnley, would the manager have been able to rest Bruno Fernandes, yeah. give rush for some, I mean, some rest and, and shuffle the team a little bit, you know, but he was able to do that because the team had won away from home at Burnley. It was at home to Crystal Palace in Carabao Cup. Yeah. So you could go into that game and, you know, shuffle the team a little bit. And also good, good, good for him. He got a victory. So I just think that the victory in itself was important. But when you look at how they played against Burnley, you still take a pause and you wonder if um, against slightly better opposition, and that's the thing, not, not against the top half side of the Premier League, but slightly better opposition with a bit of quality. Would United have walked away from that Burnley game with anything? The answer could be in any any of those because the performance wasn't convinced on that day. But against Crystal Palace, what we also saw was players who have not played enough, who are trying to get into the hearts and the minds of the manager, trying to prove a point to him. And that is why some of these competitions are important. You give French players the opportunity to show what they can do. We've seen Hannibal since coming. We've seen Canacho now start and play full 90 minutes. And we've seen his impact. We've seen Facundo Pellistri. And we saw Amrabat now that he's fit and what he could offer to the team. And I think the reason why we saw United dominating the game against Palace than they did against Burnley and other games like Bayern was maybe the inclusion of Amrabat, who started on the left-back, but never really played as a left-back, was always playing through the midfield. So he was very close to Casemiro at times. The gaps wasn't where it's huge. I just think that that is why it's important United won the games they won in the way they won them. All right. Okay. So, um, Situ has made mention of something we've been discussing, myself and Kwame, that we've gotten to a point where um, all that is all that matters is to see the team winning games because... When you win games, you're able to get your confidence back. I remember right before the game, in the pre-game interview, Ten Hag was all about the issue of United winning the game anyway, anyhow, just to restore some confidence. Well, Kwame, um, I'll come to you. On, on, on the game against um, Palace, what do you think accounted for us being able to dominate the game that way? Is it is it? Do you also come from the school of thought that winning a game against Burnley afforded us that opportunity to, you know, ring those changes. I, I mean, it made us a bit more relaxed to give opportunity to other players to also come in for us to see what's... 100%. 100%. We said it in the previous episode that, you know, we needed to put a stop to the bad form, the rot. We needed to just put a stop to it. So we set up our shot to defend and defend properly as a team against Burnley and just win. Or just about winning. It's like, just reset, you know? We needed that. We needed to just reset and then go again. Fortunately, we, we grounded out a result. We got a win. And I think that's what we took into the game against, you know, Crystal Palace. Mind you, Crystal Palace were coming into the game with problems of their own. And their manager did not sound upbeat actually get going into the fixture. So I knew he would ring the changes. If Crystal Palace are going to fill the weakened side at Old Trafford, yeah. I expect any United side on the day to be able to beat that Crystal Palace team. And that's exactly what translated on that particular evening. I wouldn't say it was, it's a performance that, you know, we should be, we can't kiss on the social, I can't use certain words. Yeah. <laughs> it's a performance we should be, overly excited about but then i mean we hadn't we, we hadn't seen united play that well from the beginning of the season so we'll, we'll take it and then we'll move on from there actually by way of performance i think is the best we've we've seen from the team this season i mean um I, we've had spells in certain in games, games where i think we've played well but then it, like, it all came together in this particular game exactly, we had the game exactly. completely under control for 90 minutes it's, so yeah it's, it's a good sign but, but Sitch, what do you think made a difference? Because I could see players willing to best their guts, players willing to run, players willing to track back. I saw areas where you could see Mason Mount and Ganacho trying to race back to win the ball back. You could see you could see that there was there was this great team spirit, there was passion, there was desire. How how has this been lacking in other games? I mean we had this little discussion in the morning where we were talking about Casemiro. I was asking whether is he back to form, and you were making you were, you made mention of structurally, you know, setting it up better for us to see the best of him. Well, what do you think made a difference in the Palace game? I think I think first off, 
there are several positions in that my United in this my United team that is up for grabs. Yeah. So when 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 the French players get the opportunity, they want to show the manager what they can offer. So the energy levels were different. Yeah. You know, Messi Mount has been out for a while. Yeah. And he still wants to prove that he can be a very key part to this side and do what Eric Ten Hag wants him to do. So we saw his energy. We see, we've seen Hannibal. And, 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 and Galacho is not stupid. He's a young man who perhaps has read all the criticisms of Marcus Rashford on social media that he doesn't work hard enough off the ball. He doesn't want to be a second Marcus Rashford who off the ball doesn't offer much. So what he tried to show, not throughout the time, but he picked this moment to try and track back and press people and try and get stuck into tackles just to remind everybody that he can work hard for the team. So there are a lot of players who are in and around the team and they are thinking there's an opportunity for them to go in, show the manager what they can do in front of the Old Trafford crowd, you know, and all of that. Now, the other thing that I worked for the team, and that is why I've said United team, it wasn't a Casemiro issue. I think Eric Ten Hag has got this great plan of his in his head that he's not necessarily been able to get it coming together on the pitch. Because when you've seen Aaron Wan-Bissaka or Dalu or Shaw, play, these players are inverting in some sort into the midfield just to make sure they have some bodies there. Yeah. The difference, however, is none of them, not one with like not Dalu, not Shaw, are comfortable coming very, very deep into the midfield or coming so much into the midfield, very close to the, the defensive midfielder, like you see John Stones do for Man City or you'd see Joao Cancelo then do for Man City or even Nico, Williams, uh, uh, Nico Lewis for City do. What, what Luke Shaw and, and maybe Dalo and one beside are comfortable to do is, at best, they would invest and maybe overlap or perhaps underlap their, their winger and come into the house space. Uh -huh. So in the house space, they can occupy there. Yeah. But the house space is in the final third of the attack, yeah. which also means that when it comes to protecting your DM or the defensive phase of your game, uh -huh. there's too much gaps. Yeah. What Amrabat offered yesterday was because he's a right-footed player playing in on the left back, mm -hmm. every time he picked the ball, he didn't progress straight into the game. He actually played into midfield. Yeah. And when he had played into midfield and laid off a pass, he didn't revert to the left back. He stayed mm -hmm. in midfield. Yeah. So he was very close to Casemiro most of the time. So we could see Casemiro beat himself yeah. because the distance and space for him to cover and defend all of a sudden became smaller. Yeah. Because guess what? There's an extra body close by who can help him defend those spaces. Mm -hmm. So in other games, you saw Ericsson, Bruno, who are three eights, double tens, what have you. And when they step it up, Casemiro alone can defend those spaces. You are playing against very high level football clubs like Bayern Munich, like Arsenal, like Spurs. There was no way Casemiro in any form of his life was, was going to be able to defend those spaces. It was impossible, practically impossible. Yesterday was better. Yeah. The other thing as well is, Having Amrabat played somewhat close to Casemiro at times enabled Macy. It's the best game we've seen of Macy Mount in the Man United College, mm -hmm. by the way. He enabled Macy Mount and Hannibal to play the double eights that Eric Ten Hag has tried to use Bruno Fernandes and Macy Mount for because there is so much cover behind them. Mm -hmm. They don't have to worry about tracking back so much. I just think structurally this team was better. Mm -hmm. But against a better opponent, I, I, I wish you if Amrabat could be playing the false left back could be inverted into midfield, but they are games surely this system should work. Hmm, interesting. I have I I really I really get the concept. I mean you've you've really broken down exactly what um a lot of us were having in our minds. I mean with mm -hmm. respect to the usage of Amrabat and and, and all of that. Kwame Sijo makes mention of some very very interesting things. I mean with the usage of Amrabat. Um I'm looking at better oppositions, you know uh, Oppositions that are, are able to use their width a lot more better, as you could see, Palace yeah. had to set back a lot more time, yeah. so we didn't get the opportunity to see, uh, you know, a, a winger threatening us from that. Those him on one on one, exactly. That is why we could afford even play Lindelof there at some point. We could have yeah. afford to play, you know, Diego Dalo could move into spaces at some point, but. How do you think this 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 system will fare? Let's do it. Let's quickly switch into the game against Palace that will be coming up on Saturday again. Um, they rested a lot of players as well. So when Eberechi mm -hmm. came inside, you could see what he was. Mm -hmm. One player who who could easily glide past you as if you don't <laughs> exist. You know, um, let's let's zoom into that. Is it going to be the same setup 
would you would you advocate for the same setup in 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 a game against Palace where we see the full strength Palace side on that day? All right. So I I think first of all he's been forced to play Amrabat at left back. Yeah. I don't think ideally he'll be playing at left back. So it's not a choice of um a system that's supposed to actually make a, a huge difference. Yeah. If Regulon it's fits, I think he comes back into the side. He would rather have a natural left-footed left-back playing left-back than have a makeshift player playing at left-back. Mm -hmm. So let's let us assume that Regulon comes back into the side. And what happens to Amrabat? I think for balance, the sake of balance, he can push Amrabat into his natural position yeah. right beside Casemiro mm -hmm. and free Casemiro up a bit. Casemiro is our top goal scorer right now. It's because he, you know, he makes these forwards into the box and then gets at the end of stuff, whether from set pieces, corners, whatever. So if Amrabat can be the security in behind, that Casemiro doesn't have to do all this mm -hmm. defensive work all mm -hmm. by himself, mm -hmm. I think it works. You can play Mason Mount in front of them. And Bruno Fernandes did play on the right against Burnley. You yeah. can stay on the right mm -hmm. against Crystal Palace in the game over the weekend. Crystal Palace are going to make changes. They're going to be stronger. Yeah. Roy Hudson knows his job. His job is to keep Palace in the league. It's not about the cup. The cup, he sacrificed the cup as far as I'm concerned. So if he brings his big boys back into, into the side, we should expect stiffer opposition from Palace. Historically, Palace give us problems at Old Trafford. Absolutely. Yeah, they yeah. do give us problems at Old Trafford. Let's not kid ourselves. If they go for Trafford, they would give us problems at Old Trafford. We've had games where even Jordan Ayew has been a problem for us at Old Trafford. So it's going to be a completely different game. I don't think we'll feel the same 11. They'll not feel the same 11. So the dynamic will be completely different. But if we go with a setup like the way I've, I've described it, I think we should be able to, you know, get another result, another win. Right now, I don't really care how we play. Today, a lot of people are putting emphasis on how we play. I just think results breed confidence. If we get back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back results, especially in the league, right, We'll start to play better. This, this team, this team just needs things to go their way. We've had a bit of Murphy's Law has been working on us right now. Things have been going against us. Let's just get results and then let's just see what, what happens after that. Okay. All right. So just win. Just let's win. Let's Any win at all. Let's just win. Okay. I would really like to see, yeah, yeah. Teacher, let me hear you. I would really like to see um a minor the team that has Amrabat as the number six. And Casemiro maybe as the number eight. He's not your typical number eight. Yeah. But I'd like to see how that works because if Eric Ten Hag wants to start defending from the front, I wonder if Casemiro and Bruno Fernandes being those um, triggers in behind Marcus Rashford and Hoyland. I want because he's a very good reader of situations. Yeah. So if you're going to push Casemiro a little bit up the pitch, knowing that he's got security behind him, yeah, that could really be another phase where United defending from the front could have another weapon in them. And because, of course, he can track back to make it a double pivot, yeah. he can be sweet to be the number eight. You know, so I'm, I'm just thinking it will be very fascinating to see if that works. I, I mean, ideally, that's what we are all looking at. Um, to see how the combination between the two works. A lot of, like you're advocating, a lot of us have also, have also been advocating for that. Because me, I'm thinking that since Casemiro came into United, it's been more, more of an eight than a six for me because... He's almost everywhere, and I. He's a goal threat. He's creating. Yesterday, he created goals. He he scored a yeah. goal himself. I mean, he offers us a lot more. But there's news. So the news is that we play Newcastle United. You just saw it. Yeah, <laughs> we play Newcastle United in the Carabao Cup in the fourth round of the Carabao Cup. It's at home. It's, it's at, at home. home. I don't. I mean, yeah. we've been so lucky to be drawing a lot of these cup games at home. And uh, Situ, are we winning? <laughs> Listen, my United at home is a very, it's a very, they are very strong at home. Yeah. But they're, Newcastle are again are beginning to become a cup team. We saw them at San Siro. Yes. They didn't look like a team that they were terrified of the occasion. They've never been there in the last 20 years, but they, they, they enjoy the moment. And again, listen, the, the next round is very far from here. You don't know the injury situations. Yes. You know the form of the team and the players. So okay. let, let's put it in the fridge. When the time is closer, we can have a proper analysis of what's going on. It's a home draw. I'll take it. It's a home draw, right? Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> With your full chest. <laughs> I'll take it. 
Anyway, all right, guys. So thank you so much. Um, Sicho, but let's look into the Palace game, the dynamics at play. Um, Palace won't fail the team that they failed at, um, in the cup. Um, like Kwame rightly said, historically, they've been a team that try to mm -hmm. cause us trouble anytime they come up against us. Um, I don't remember the last time we won comfortably against Palace at Old Trafford. And our Rangnick, we had to pray that Fred got that goal for us. Last season, um, we were winning by two goals to one. And then Casemiro was sent off at some point and we had to struggle to see ourselves over the line. Seasons before that, we had lost back-to-back -back against them and Ole and Associates. So they've been a team and that that's, that's always been kind of a boogie team for us. Even at Old Trafford, um, what 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 do you think Warren Hudson is going to do differently? Let's look at their team, the Palace team, because they look yeah. like a team that is well drilled to defend against teams like us. Absolutely, they are. They really are. And 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 what what Hudson does is he's almost always leaving Eze free, and Eze is not necessarily drawn into the whole defensive phase of the game. As they almost always the outlet for them because it's a brilliant career of the ball. He can he can just take the team 20 yards forward with just one dazzle of his body. And and when we see Jeffrey Schlopp play as sometimes the number 10, when the team is defending, Jeffrey Schlopp goes wide to just make it if you like four and then a five and then a one-one, because Ezra would be the one to set up for Eduard or Mateta, whoever starts. So United would be aware of that. But when they break, they've got some genuine pace in the side. And it could cause problems for my United. The problem then I've had with United this season is the, the amount of ease teams run through the middle. Because normally you want to close the midfield and get them to go wide. When you when the when the when the ball is wide, you've got all the time in the world to recover. You've got all the time in the world to guess that cross could be bad. Yeah. But when the ball is central, yeah. one good ball takes the opponent 1v1 with your goalkeeper, and it could be devastating. Yeah. Now, as we said, if Amrabat and Casemiro are gonna play. Or he's going to play anything close to what we saw against Palace in the Carabao Cup. Maybe the spaces in midfield are closer yeah. because Casemiro would have Amrabat closer to him. Mason Mount's energy might be important. Bruno's energy might be important. So United's reaction to trying to get behind the ball could be the solution. But if they are always going to be ahead of the ball and they, they are not going to be tracking back as fast as you know other teams do, then Palace are going to be running at United. And you don't want anybody running at United's back line because the communication is just not there. We spoke about the midfield a lot. But there are many times that our back line should be able to cut out some of those threats, but they just don't communicate enough. And I'm beginning to worry a little bit about Martinez because he's very instinctive and aggressive. He oversteps his line, which actually double, he doubles up with his partner most of the time when he has to stay in his line and guide his partner. And so that needs to be sorted out because Palace will run at United, they'll hit on the counter, and Eze is going to be the carrier who's going to be surging the team forward. So that should be where I think everything Ten who should know all of this, will be trying to stop. And get more control of the ball. All right. Kwame, um, let's look at the setup. Um, now that Mount is back, um, mm -hmm. would you play a double pivot of um Amrabat and Casemiro? I'm going to shift Mount to the right, given that um Bruno at number 10, Rashford, um, left wing, and then Rasmus Hoylon as a striker is, is the team I have in mind. I don't know if you agree with me on, 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 on that. Right. So basically we are operating with the players who are available. Yes. If Reguilion is not available, automatically Amrabat is going to play at left back. That changes the constitution of the midfield. Mm -hmm. You'll probably have to play with Casemiro and either somebody with like Hannibal yeah. and Mount in front of them or Bruno in front of them. Mm -hmm. The way I see Mount and Bruno working right now is I have this famous line I always say, nothing, everything must not happen by design, right? Design, yeah. So we all have our right wingers out. We yeah. Anton is not available, Sancho is not available. The right spot is up for grabs. Pelistri is an obvious um, option in that particular position. But then you could also play yeah. interchange Bruno and Mount yeah. in that position. They don't necessarily have to stay there all throughout the game. Yeah. You could have Bruno playing as a 10 mm -hmm. in bits and then Mount playing as a 10 in bits. Okay. Both players can also comfortably produce something from the right-hand side. Okay. So that solves that Mount-Bruno conundrum. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. They both can play on the in the same team, but not necessarily as the two eights. In the same position. The two eights we've seen it has problems, it has yeah. deficiencies, it doesn't necessarily work because you have to play just one sole defensive midfielder, yeah. and very often that has to be Casemiro. Yeah, he can't do that defensive work yeah. on his own, he doesn't have the legs to cover all that ground. Yeah. So if Wegelian is fit, I'm praying it's fit because I do want to see Amrabat mm -hmm. pair up with Casemiro in the middle of the park okay. just to give us that defensive solidity. Right. The center backs haven't covered themselves in glory this season. It doesn't matter who plays, be it Varan, be it Martinez, be it Harry Maguire, be it Johnny Evans. They've all had their ups and downs this season. If we could just be defensively solid by having a pair of sixes in front of them. I think that would do us the world of good. All right. Touch on Rashford for me in a minute. A lot of people have... All right. So, Rashi. Rashi's my boy. Yes, I know. Rashi's my boy. And That's very often, bring that I, question defend, I defend him over the hill. Yeah. A lot of people have criticized him for a lack of defensive effort off the ball. Mm -hmm. But then again, he is the only player in our team that I feel is able to run in behind defenses constantly. Yeah. Most players in our setup don't have the ability to do so. You're asking somebody to do that as well as cover so much ground, mm -hmm. also defensively. It's a huge task. Yeah. So sometimes you have to, as a coach, because I feel tactically the manager has him doing certain things that us fans do not agree with. The manager is always on his side of the touchline most of the time. And he sees him not track back all the time. I feel, I feel it's just my 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 thinking that it's a tactical instruction to keep your most dangerous offensive player in offensive positions most of the time. Conserve your energy as much as possible so you can do damage on the offensive side. He's almost like an outlet for us when we need to go in the over the top and in behind defenses. So, so yes, you do not agree with. The assertion that I do not entirely agree with it, but I get I get the, I the I get it does the, I get a look. It doesn't look good all the time when you see the fact that he isn't tracking back all the time. But we've seen in certain games this season compared to last season. For instance, the Arsenal game. Yeah, you could see clearly he was asked to double up. Yeah, on Saka. Saka. Last season he was asked to stay up whilst Luke Shaw had the sole responsibility of <laughs> trying to stop Saka. Yeah. So I feel, in as much as the optics. Ain't great. I feel they may be tactical. Yeah. His, his, the way he he plays may solely be a tactical thing. It's yeah. not necessarily him being lazy or anything like that. Right. All right. Okay. Sijo, what what's your thoughts on that? In a minute, then we switch to the Galatasaray. Yeah. Right. yeah I, I, listen. Again, I think the, the the main problem I have with Marcus Rashford is when something is happening in and around him, he doesn't apply himself enough of the ball. And it's also not necessarily making the right choices in in the in, the, in attacking phase of the game yes. when to release the ball. And, and it's still surprising that he still got a very terrible left foot at the age of 25, 26. I, th I thought with the quality he had should have maybe been better with his left foot. He doesn't know when to cross, when to take on his man, doesn't know when to, you know, just cushion the boys, almost always going for the, the par. And that is part of his game that is frustrating. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely get why. Eric Ten Hag would want Marcus Rashford to stay high up the pit and drop in so deep because Ten Hag has said it before, he wants to play transitional football. Mm -hmm. And when you've got players like Bruno Fernandes, Eriksen, Casemiro, at times yeah. Lindelof, who can Martinez, who the ball who can ping. Ping. absolutely, who can ping. Yeah. The, it's like Mbappe for France. Yeah. He doesn't work off the ball. He doesn't drop deep. He, there's no point. Exactly. Because France are sitting deep. Popova will find him. Rabiot will find him. Antoine Griezmann will find him. Tromain will find him. You know, so it's like like Pame said, it's almost an outlet. Now, if you want Marcus Rashford to track deep, as soon as he to get the ball, they need a couple of combination passes and play and movement to move the ball higher up the pitch. Mm -hmm. But because of his brilliant movement, running in behind teams, it's almost as if stay high up when you get the ball. And you go on Nana, who's a brilliant pass of the ball as yeah. well. So why don't you make use of that? Yeah. I think it's not come, it's not clicked yet. Yeah. It's not clicked yet, so it doesn't look great. But okay. when it clicks yeah. and he start dropping the ball better, mm -hmm. he start he start finding him in behind the lines better. It will make a lot more sense. Are we winning on Saturday, Sijo? I think at Old Trafford, Manchester United are, are good to win, especially winning back to back games, keeping two clean sheets. Something they've not done, they've not 
done frequently this season. That that should be confident boost for them to win again this weekend. Kwame, go Trafford. We've beaten teams that we are supposed to beat this season. That's We've lost to teams exactly. that we kind of know that we are going to lose to. So yeah, so Palace is a game I expect us to win. It's a team I expect us to beat, so we're going to win this weekend. All right, thank you very much, guys. So that's it on the game against Crystal Palace. And also, we've done a preview of uh, we've done a preview of the game against Palace as well. So, Situ, I'm going to give you this time. I I felt we could do the Galatasaray game, but um, we'll, we'll look at it some other time. I will be doing the post game of that Galatasaray game, rather. But Situ, you, you've had issues. I'll give you just three minutes. I wanted to give you four minutes. We have just four minutes to end the whole thing. Um, three minutes is fine. Three minutes is fine. What is your problem with Tin Hag? I've got, mm-hmm. I've the, got Twitter people, no the Twitter people want to link you. The Twitter guy yeah, emotional. To link you. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, but, but I understand football without emotions. Of course, of sense. course, I get you. Yeah, so I absolutely understand how and you, when you support a football club, you give it your all. But my my my, my thing about Eric Ten Hag is he's a, he's a he's a great manager, right? And last season, I, I consistently said it on social media that I thought he was overachieving with the score that he had at Man United. Because that squad doesn't mirror anything Eric Ten Hag. It had nothing to reflect the Ten Hag that we think we know. Yeah. But when you think Eric Ten Hag, we think his Ayaz team that was so brilliant on the eye to see control games. You know, players looked like they were in their pump. So last season, the way United played, I gave it a pass. Yeah. And last season, there wasn't any stretch of games that United had any against you whatsoever. Yeah. It was win as you go or play as you go. Mm-hmm. Every single game. He had a way of winning the game or had a way of setting up the team to win. Mm-hmm. It could be tactical. It could also be the fact that he had injury problems. Yeah. Now, after his second preseason with the group, mm-hmm. I'm expecting to see a United team that has an identity. And the reason this is crucial for my United is if they don't find an identity, there is a clear chance or high percentage of chance of United signing players who they will miss profile or signing players that wouldn't be a fit. Signing players who are good for a team A, but not necessarily good for a team B, because they've got no clear identity. Okay. Now, here's the point. For Eric Ten Hag to know, for, for Man United to be able to identify players who can come through and get the job done, and almost instantly, yeah. Eric Ten Hag has to coach some players out of the team. A player like Jadin Sancho, a player like maybe Marcus Russell, maybe Maguire, Mm-hmm. The manager says he can't use them. A, a player like says he can't use them. He doesn't fancy McTominay. But there are no clear reasons why he doesn't fancy McTominay. You, nobody knows why. Nobody knows really, nobody really knows why he doesn't fancy Maguire. We know he makes mistakes, all of that. Yeah. But when there's a clear identity and style, it is easy for us to pinpoint and say, McTominay can't play that way. Maguire can't play that way. But when you watch Man United, there is no, there is no time that you can say that Eric McTominay can't play in the Man United midfield. Mm-hmm. Especially in the game against Spurs. In a game against Arsenal, you know, in the way they should play. Yeah. Now, Ten Hag has to develop an identity and a brand of football for the club. Mm-hmm. That by now we should be seeing. Yeah. But as we sit here now, the Kwame said it doesn't matter how we play, team just has to win. But it should matter how the team plays. Uh-huh. Right? You can play well and lose games. I have no problems with that. But when you don't have an identity, then it's a problem. Now the thing also, the problem I also have with Eric Ten Hag is that he said. And, and it's a, it, it could very much spin on him. Yeah. He sets a very high standard at the club. Yeah. Now, if the players realize that mm-hmm. results and the tactics and coaching are not mixing up with that standard, mm-hmm. they start looking over their students, start questioning him. Okay. And he has to start delivering that. So, yeah, I like Eric Ten Hag. Yeah. I think you've achieved with the squad last season. Mm-hmm. But this season is a bigger test for him. He has to develop an identity and then win the boys who can fit into that style. You know, by playing them in the system. So yeah, right. that's my only cue of there. All right, all right, all right, all right. So you'll be back once again to discuss. We will we, we'll have an extensive show that to discuss this whole thing about yeah. getting started. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Kwame and Chubu Siaku. Thank you so much, Tito. It's been amazing yeah. having you here on the show today. Thank you so much to you. Remember to hit the subscribe and then the notification bell so that anytime we release a new new episode, you'll be notified of it so it's been great having you guys on this um ninth episode of this podcast thank you so much um uh, for joining us today we are so grateful to you so we'll be back same time next week on this same channel on our youtube channel have a great time